welcome back. Some of you may know him as a sports analyst on ESPN. And others of you may remember his days as a senior writer at Sports Illustrated. And some of you may know him as a sports columnist from the Boston Globe. But no matter his title, his influence on the game of baseball has earned him the nickname The Commissioner. But growing up in Massachusetts, he was just like any other little boy, a Red Sox fan. Well, I grew up in Groton, and it was like 2,000 people. So it was, a, it was the classic small New England town on the New Hampshire border where everyone talked about the Red Sox all the time. I mean, it was a legal excuse um, to leave elementary school early to go to the Red Sox opening day, which my mother took me to every year. So I was able to leave at like 10 o'clock in the morning every year to go see the Washington Senators, whoever was in town. Jackie Jensen was my favorite player back in the 50s. After graduating from the Groton School in 1963, Peter headed south to the University of North Carolina, where he studied English and political science. In 1968, in search of a job, he returned to his home state and began what would be a long career at the Boston Globe. I just wrote letters around in the summer of 68, and um, I came up for an interview, and uh, they, they gave me the internship. But it was great fun because the other guy there with me was Bob Ryan, so the two of us started the day Robert Kennedy was assassinated. In those days, there was a morning and an afternoon edition of the paper. Their assignment was to call every major league team and report on how each would honor Kennedy. Well, late stocks paper came up, it was 3.30, quarter, four in the afternoon. They're on the very front page of the paper, not the sports page, front page of the paper, we had a dual byline. Gimmins went on to cover the baseball beat at the Globe into the mid 70s, reporting on some exciting teams. Somebody was asking me, What's your favorite game ever played? Well, I guess it would be 91, the seventh game when Jack Morris beat John Smoltz, one to nothing in 10 innings. But growing up in New England, I would say, and covering the Red Sox, and having Louis Tiant, my favorite Red Sox player that I ever covered, the fourth game of that series when he threw 173 pitches and had two men on, with one out in the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth innings, all holding a five to four lead and one. To me, that was one of the greatest games ever uh, that I ever covered. At the end of the following season, Peter left the Globe to write for Sports Illustrated, covering baseball, hockey, and college basketball. I went to Sports Illustrated the first time in September of 76, because it seemed like a logical career move. And I actually did enjoy some of the hockey. I did some baseball, and I love college basketball. But uh, I missed, really missed the everyday baseball. So he returned to the Globe and remained there for another eight years. He became known for his Sunday Notes column, a compilation of timely facts about the team. He adopted the format from New York Daily News sports writer Dick Young and developed it into a style that became a staple in sports sections across the country. I asked Fran Rose of the Globe sports writer if I could do a weekly column on the Red Sox farm system and started that dot, dot, dot thing on that. And then they liked it. And so the next year when I was covering the Red Sox regularly, they said, okay, go ahead and do it. Lou Gorman was named general manager of the Red Sox in 1984 and quickly recognized Gammon's diligence. You knew when he covered the team that he had in-depth reports from different sources before he talked to you. You knew that what he, information he had about your club came from everybody he had talked to throughout the game. So you know that when he came to you, he had some very sensible and good questions to ask you. When you read his column, you found out things that others didn't know that he knew because of his contacts in the game. I think people respected him. They thought he was trustworthy, he was an honest guy, he was conscientious, hardworking, and he was kind of a legendary kind of guy in the game. So when you read his columns, you got a great deal of information. In 1986, Gammons returned to Sports Illustrated and enjoyed success as a senior writer. Then John Walsh, who had been the managing editor at Rolling Stone and Newsday, joined ESPN and saw a future for Peter on television. He approached me and his idea was that the, that the whole world was changing. It was no longer going to be talking as information would be king. I was the first one at ESPN. I mean, Will McDonough was the first person to do it. He went to NBC. I was the second person to do it. And, it, you know, again, it was it really doing for the network what I did for a newspaper. Because he made the transition so seamlessly, these days he's best known for his work as an analyst on ESPN. But he'll never forget his roots. I still, even though I'm, I'm most of what I do is now television, you know, I still came out of the newspaper business and I'm really proud of it. In 2005, he was honored at the Baseball Hall of Fame as a recipient of the J.G. Taylor Spink Award, 
given for meritorious contributions to baseball writing. Steve Jobs' advice to the graduating class of Stanford this year was, find what you love. Well, I'm here today because I found what I love. It was a remarkable experience in that that club is so unique. I mean, you can't buy your way into it. You can't be born into it. But probably my highlight was we were standing, we were, we were waiting in the waiting area behind the stage for the, for the ceremony. And Willie Mays came up to me and he handed me a ball and said, sign this. And I looked at it and there were, the names on it were all the players. I said, Willie, I can't sign it. I'm not a Hall of Fame player. And he looked at me and he actually put his arm around, my, around me and he said, look, you're one of us. And then he said, I'll kick you in the rear end if you don't sign it. Another moment Gammons will never forget is the underhand toss from Keith Folk to Doug Mankiewicz, the moment the Red Sox won their first World Series in 86 years. Although his line of work requires him to be unbiased, the moment took him back to his younger days as a Sox fan. It was a funny moment because I, I was thinking a lot about um, the last time I saw my father alive, 25 years ago. The last thing he said as we, as we walked out the door in his hospital room was, well, I got to see the Red Sox won the World Series four times in my lifetime. They will win in yours. So that was the first thing I thought about was my father. His passion for his hometown team inspired him to organize an annual event, Hot Stove Cool Music, to benefit the Jimmy Fund, the official charity of the Red Sox. The annual concert features various local musicians, including himself. It's just an opportunity to have fun and help some people. And what keeps him going after nearly 40 years of tireless work in baseball is simply and purely his passion for the game. <laughs> I love the everyday part of it. I love that your emotions change. I love, um, I love the game. And I, I just, I love the fact that there is no clock. And I love the fact that you know, I obviously covered a team that led another team by 14 games and didn't win. But there's nothing that's ever really over. I remember the, you know, the Red Sox being nine out in 1988 and coming back from behind with Joe Morgan and, and ending up in the playoffs. It's, it's a great fun to that. And I do think that people play out their lives as fans more in baseball than they do in any other sport. It becomes part of your life ingrained. Even if you don't see the game, you know, you get up in the morning and the box score tells you, oh, you know, how could such and such go over for, you know, how did such and such get the hold? It's a great thing.